All right, welcome everyone. This is lecture two. And before we get started, I have a couple of announcements. So the first announcement is that I posted a discussion link on Submitty, if you've had a chance to look at that. Um, so that that actually counts towards your participation grade. Um, I don't know if you, if you go to like discussion forum, you can see this thread and you have to either respond to that or not just like respond to that and, and you have to reply to somebody else's post as well, right? So at least one reply or response to somebody else's post and at least one of your own response. And then um, think about it like this participation is like 10% of your overall grade. That means like we'll have roughly speaking 10 discussions and also like one point per discussion. So that's how this counts, right? So that's the first thing. The other thing that I have on uh, like the goals for today's lecture, which is about homework one. So homework one is not released yet, but I'm going to release it today in the afternoon, right? I will talk about like what it is going to be about, what is expected, how to submit and other things towards the end of the lecture today. Okay, so that's that. And let me think if there's something else. Yeah, so I think that's all in terms of announcements. If you have any questions, just let me know. Uh, Let's begin with today's lecture. So today's lecture is again talking a little bit more about uh, the model that we talked, uh, like the linear model that we discussed last night. But today we are going to talk more about gradient descent. And the reason I'm focusing too much on gradient descent, and in addition to that, I'll also talk about the optimization algorithms that are used to uh, make the performance of gradient descent better, is because this is going to be the fundamental uh, like algorithm that we'll be using when we implement deep learning uh, networks, like neural networks uh, specifically. So that's why we really need to understand how gradient descent works and then how can we optimize it and why do we need to optimize it in the very first place, right? So the, can somebody just like close the door? <laughs> Thank you. Okay, so there is a, a research paper which is like uh, pretty popular in the research community that everybody cites when we talk about gradient descent. So the way I thought about like going over this is that I'm going to discuss that paper. So we are going to go into the details of like what are, what gradient descent is, what are the different variants of gradient descent, and how, like why do we need to improvise? Where do we need to improvise, and why we need those optimization algorithms, right? So that's what this like point number five is going to cover, four and five essentially. Now, in addition to all of this, and this is like a little bit different in this lecture, I'm also going to talk a little bit about like the tools that are used for data manipulation and pre-processing in specifically, you, like if you're working with Python. And reason being that I know that there, there is like so much information out there, right? If you just like Google uh, data manipulation or you just Google pre-processing, there are so many things out there. So I just like wanted to narrow down your search to these things. So it's not like in, in any way an exhaustive uh, kind of demonstration of like how to do data manipulation or how to do pre-processing. But I'm going to just like introduce a couple of tools which I feel are more than sufficient to get started at least. And then obviously, as you start working through that, you will yourself uh, like uncover a lot of other uh, related packages, related uh, tools, et cetera, right? So I just like wanted to get started with like because that is where you'll start your homework, right? So that's why I'm going to talk about data manipulation, pre-processing, specifically TensorFlow and NumPy. And I would say like in class, I'm just covering TensorFlow, a little bit of that. And then I'm going to point you to the resources where you can check what to look, where, and other things. And then there are two important uh, aspects of, especially when we are implementing algorithms like gradient descent, like using vectorization and broadcasting. So I'm going to talk a little bit about that as well. Okay, so let's get started. Okay, so the first thing that I'm looking at is data manipulation. And you will see straight from your homework one, you will be acquiring data, right? And then you will have to process that in some way, right? So there has to be some starting point, like how do you get, get started with that? And one quick resource is TensorFlow, which is nothing but an open uh, source end-to-end -end machine learning library developed by Google. And that's like easily available for us to like for data pre-processing, for modeling, and in fact, you can do everything within TensorFlow. You can uh, do data processing, data cleaning, um, and then uh, even using any of the machine learning models, implementing them, getting the results using TensorFlow, right? So here is a link that I've provided. And if you just like go to this link under resources, you can get 
like all the information about TensorFlow. And why am I pointing you to this resource? Because this is going to be specifically useful uh, when we start working with deep learning and um, like neural networks, right? So this is something that we'll be using throughout. And um, like before we jump into what like tensors are, I'm also like, I know I wanted to introduce NumPy, which is like another Python library that's used for data pre-processing and data cleaning and other things. But I thought that maybe you can um, like try, you can try discovering, if you're familiar with Python, I'm sure you will be able to discover that yourself and work with that yourself. And so I've provided a link to the official uh, NumPy uh, website. There it is. If you just like go to documentation, and you can get started. I would say like, just go to this like NumPy quick start. If you're not familiar with this, you can get started right from here, right? So this is going to help you not just like work with the like the data set that, that you like start working with. And then uh, it will help you organize them. It will help also in like data visualization to, to a certain extent. So my recommendation is like go to this quick start link and at least like try some of the basics, for example, like creating a NumPy array. What is a NumPy array? It's, it's nothing but but like a vector, right? So we treat it as a vector. It could have dimensions. So what, what does those dimensions mean and so on, right? So I'm guessing everybody is more or less familiar with this, but still I just wanted to let you guys like go and play with this because I know that this is going to be useful when you start working on your homework one, right? So that's the first thing. And the good news here is that if you decide to use like either NumPy or TensorFlow, and if you're working in Google Colab, you can use both of them. If you decide to use TensorFlow right from the beginning, you have like all functionalities in TensorFlow as well. So that's why I decided, let me just like introduce a little bit of TensorFlow and then go from there. If you decide to switch between both of them, I'm fine with that. There is like nothing um, special, except that, that that special thing about TensorFlow is going to show up when we start working with huge data sets. And I'm going to talk about that as well, right? So as I said, go and take some time. I would I would say don't hardly take like a, an hour or so or less than that if you just like go over this and try to understand what NumPy arrays are, how to create them, how to manipulate them, and other things. And if you're like, uh, if you encounter any issues, just like feel free to come to my office hours or feel free to email me. Okay. All right, so let's move on to TensorFlow. As I said, you can use either one of them. So let's begin with this. And so what is a tensor? Like where does that term come from? Well, actually that the term is used like for a, some numeric representation, a multi-dimensional numeric uh, like representation of data. That's where the word comes from, right? So now that multi-dimensional uh, representation, numeric representation could be anything. It could be like a vector. It could be a matrix. But then when we think about vectors and matrices, right? Vector is like a series, right? So usually like in a single like list kind of a data structure, you have something, some, some value store, right? That's what you think when you think about a vector. And then there are like matrices, then, then you have like the different rows and columns, right? So that's what you think about when you think of a matrix. But think about like the data sets that have like more than like any n dimensions, right? And then there is something that's not the concept of axis that we will be using a lot when we're working with data. So the good thing about tensors is that it could be like any dimensional. It could be like any n dimensional. So basically they've come up with this idea for tensor being any dimensional object a data object. And it allows you to save, um, save the, like create those objects and manipulate them, right? It's so a high level. And why do you, why do you need like the, these uh, multi-dimensional objects? Well, you'll be working with different types of problems, right? So let's say you, you're working on a natural language processing problem. There is no numeric data available. There is no format. You're just like getting some text from somewhere, right? Or, or maybe like I'm speaking and you're, you're trying to record that and then, then using it to recognize things. So eventually what you have to do with like whatever form of data is available, you'll have to convert it to some numeric format, right? And so that's where like the, the, the idea of like, that's why we are so much like obsessed with this idea of like dimensionality, numeric representation, because Eventually, all the machine learning algorithms work with numeric data and not the textual data that you have. Or, or maybe like, let's say I'm working with images, right? You know that images have like these pixels and so we are converting them to some numeric representation. So basically what the point I'm trying to make is that every machine learning algorithm works with, like most of the machine learning algorithms work with numeric data. And at one point or the other, we will be converting everything that we have into numeric data. And once we have done that, 
we will be saving them in one form or the other in the form of an array, either as a, as a NumPy array or as a tensor. Right, so that's the fundamental idea. That's something that should like you should remember, and and like whenever you're working with a new problem, that that is the the flow that should come to your mind. Right. Okay. So then here is some like uh, what all could tensors be? As I said, they could be numbers themselves. It could be an image. It could be text. And we will see how we can how we like reach to that point, right? From text to numbers, or from images to numbers. So there there is a process for that. But that's why these are so useful. All right, so then the question arises, well, I can work with NumPy as well. So where, why, like what is the big advantage of TensorFlow and what is the advantage of like creating tensors rather than NumPy arrays? So the real, I think, benefit comes uh, from the hardware side of things, which we are not too much bothered initially because we're not working with that much data, but eventually we will, right? So there is this like concept of like GPUs that's like pretty, that's catching up real fast. So these are graphical processing units. So again, this is coming from the hardware side of things. And the good thing with TensorFlow is that it really gels well with those, right? And even better, if you're working on Google, right? And let me show you if uh, you can see this option runtime, right? So if you just like go to runtime and, okay. And then go to this change runtime type, right? And notice like it's giving me this hardware accelerator uh, option, right? So I can explicitly go and select this GPU or TPU, which is like tensor processing unit or um, graphical, pro graphical processing unit, right? And that will make my processing way faster than it would like in a normal run. So that's the big advantage with tensors. And that's why like we, everybody is moving towards that, the idea of like using TensorFlow more for machine learning applications because we have so much data. And we want efficiency there, right? So that's the the fundamental difference between why we are we want to create a tensor versus a NumPy array. But as I said, like initially speaking, like initially when you're starting now with the like with your projects, it's like okay because I'm guessing we're not work we we, we won't start like all of a sudden uh, start working with huge data sets. So it's fine if you are if you start working with uh, like a NumPy array or if you're comfortable using NumPy first, it's fine with that as well. Okay. Questions, doubt? I just like realize I'm the one just talking and, and not letting anyone else say anything. This is pretty straightforward, so that's that's okay. Like no question, that's fine. Uh, so moving on, I just wanted to introduce like you can, uh, and as you can see, like in the collab, you have this option of text and code, just like in a Jupyter notebook. So it's pretty similar to that. So I just added some code here, like how to import TensorFlow uh, usually the convention is import TensorFlow. And here I'm just checking the version number. So usually it's like, I think 2.6 is the, the most recent one. And yeah, so that's how you import it. Just like you've been importing other Python libraries, nothing great here. But you will see like some RAM and disk gets allocated the moment I start running uh, my code on Google Colab, right? And then as I said earlier, depending on your hardware selection, that can like really improve your output and other things. Uh, all right, so I just picked a few examples to get you started. There's nothing that you cannot find like in the TensorFlow documentation, but still I wanted to demonstrate uh, like some of that. And obviously my recommendation is that like, I think three to four weeks from now, you will need to work with TensorFlow a lot. So maybe just like going back and forth, checking different functions would help, I would say on the homework and other things, right? So as I I think I already talked about this, like what a tensor is. Uh, here I'm just creating a, a one dimensional tensor and just like showing you what it looks like. So once you create a tensor, all you have to do is like tf dot range is like have these values, right? So there are lots of ways of creating tensors. And I think what you should be doing, and I'll show you a few ways here, what you should be doing is trying to understand if let's like you've created you've read in data from a CSV file, let's say, right? So then how will you convert that to a tensor? I think that should be like step one. So here I'm just like generating my own uh, data using dot range and it has, as you can see, 12 values. And this gives me like this attribute, this shape, right? And this shape is telling me that it has like these 12 uh, values in here, right? So this is very similar to an NumPy array, like nothing fancy happening here. And I can do a dot shape method to just like check uh, what it has. Uh, it becomes really like interesting when we have like different like 
number of rows and columns because then that's a matrix, right? Right now it's just like a one dimensional vector kind of a thing. So again, you can do a dot size, check the size. Uh, here I'm doing a dot reshape and this method uh, dot reshape exists in NumPy as well. So what you can do is I have like this input X and I'm trying to convert it into a three by four matrix. So I can do that in TensorFlow and I can do that in NumPy as well. So all I did was like go and do a dot reshape three by four. So that means three rows and four columns. Now, the good thing about my X here was that it had 12 values. So I could do a three by four. If it had 11, then this is going to throw an error. So the whole point of showing you this little example here is be uh, aware of like what values your data has and based on that do a reshape or uh, whatever uh, like operation you're trying to apply to that, right? Because like, on purpose, I created 12 values because I know that this can be three by four. If I'm doing a three by four on like 11 values, then it doesn't make sense, right? So this like a small thing, but I know that this reshape error is like one of the most common when you start working with data. Uh, all right, so here I already discussed that. Um, yeah, so a, a few more things, for example, you can do an X dot reshape using minus one, four or, or three minus one. So here, Minus one is saying allocate. So the first, like whenever you're doing a reshape, right? The first uh, element or the first value is going to be rows. And the second is going to be columns always, like rows and columns, okay? So when I'm saying minus one and then four, right? So I already like specify that have four columns and I don't know how many rows. So then whatever, like based on the data, if it is like a multiple of four, it's going to allocate those many rows. So similar to that, it's going to do like a reshape using this. So I just specified the rows. If it's a multiple of three, it's going to allocate uh, like the columns on its own. Right, so try like doing these uh, small manipulations by creating your own data. That's my recommendation because when you read in like actual data and then try doing these things, and sometimes it becomes like difficult to like understand what's happening. So like, even before you start working on your homework, and I don't think the homework involves uh, too much, but but still, like getting started with this. And that's the whole point of like first part of today's lecture. Just like get yourself acquainted with these small things. Uh, all right. Sometimes uh, what we need, and in many of the algorithms, let's say we need some initialization parameters. And usually we, we begin with zeros and ones, right? So one quick way, both in NumPy and TensorFlow is that you can do this like tf.zeros or tf.ones and then specify these dimensions. Now notice like there are three dimensions here instead of two. Right, so that's the good thing about uh, TensorFlow. So it's allowing me to, so I'm saying here, tf dot zeros, and let me just comment this first, just the zeros. So create two uh, of these matrices, that, that's what it means, right? So two of these, basically two of three by four uh, matrices, right? So let me just like run this, right? So the, the two of them with like dimensions three by four, right? So similarly, I can create ones, I want to create it. I, I want to uh, create three of these with dimensions three by four, right? So if I just like run them, I get that. Okay, so that's that. Uh, sometimes you want to de like derive uh, data from different distributions. So please go and check this like tf dot random. So I'm, I've given just like one example of like, let's say we are sampling from a normal distribution uh, with some uh, input, uh, like this is the standard normal. So please go and check in the TensorFlow documentation how you can create, like how, how can you extract data from different distribution types and how can you change the parameters of the normal distribution, right? So this is the standard normal zero mean and uh, one standard deviation, but you have like other options as well. So again, this is an important aspect of any data science project or any machine learning project that you have to sometimes just like sample from a distribution, right? So it's very easy, a single line of code, that's how you can do that. And you can do the same in NumPy as well. Uh, okay, so here I just wanted to show you that there is something that's known as tf dot constant, and what that does is that it takes the input as some constant, like a Python list, for example, here, and converts it to a tensor. So why was this operation important? That's important because maybe let's say I read in data, and I created a data frame, let's say, and then I wanted to convert it to a tensor. So you can do that using dot constant. And then there are other methods as well that are more efficient. So again, the best I could do in class is just like give you one example of each and then you will have to go in and see what works with your data. And that's the whole point of like this class, right? 
Okay, so that was a quick intro to TensorFlow. As I said, I already pointed you to this link. Please take out some time to go through that because that's going to be like really helpful when we work on our projects. Okay. Uh, all right. So what next? So the other things, two important things that I wanted to uh, talk about was operations when we are working with these uh, either NumPy arrays or, or TensorFlow. That's the first thing. And this is important because if you're too much like used to like Python way of coding, sometimes we are inclined to use loops and other things for every element. And I just wanted to show you if this is like a ten, uh, if, if it's a tensor or a NumPy array, a lot of things are very easy here. So you don't have to worry too much because like the first time I started working on this, I was like, okay, I'll have to go and write a loop to get every element and do something with it, right? You don't have to do that because most of the operations are already like done element wise. For example, here uh, I created like the first tensor here, x equals tf dot constant, just gave a list, it created a tensor, right? And then I created another tensor, y, and just like another list, right? And what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to add like element, I'm, I'm trying to do some element wise addition. For example, I want to add one to two, two to two, four to two, eight to two, right? And similarly, I want to do subtraction, multiplication, division, and exponentiation. So the way this works here is that these operators work element wise, right? If you remember in Python, if you're doing like a list plus a list, what happens? Anybody? It concatenates, right? So there's a, there's a difference here. If this is a tensor, it's not going to concatenate, but it's going to do an element wise thing. Why? Because it considers every element as an important, like as a point in that like, vector or matrix, right? And so that's why it's, it's going to do an element-wise addition, suspend, and you can see the results here, right? So look at the first one, it just added them, right? And then the second one, it just like sub subtracted every element. So now here's the thing, let's say if I do something like this, right? Uh, they don't have the same dimensions, and so what will happen to the last one, right? Let me just like run this, right? It's, it's going to throw an error. So this is something that we have to keep in mind. Again, the whole point of showing you this is that if you had a large data set and you were trying to do this operation, and let's say there was a difference in dimension, you're going to get this error, right? So just like be aware that if there is a dimensionality difference, this is, it won't, like this operator thing won't work anymore, right? So yeah, this, this should work now. Okay, so, and sometimes like if let's say I have a tensor and I'm, I'm multiplying it by a constant, again, that multiplication also happens, uh, uh, I would say element wise, right? So it's not going to replicate. Like in, a, in Python, you must have noticed if like I do a list times some integer, it replicates that, right? But here it won't do that. It's going to go and pick the elements and multiply them. So that's good thing, right? You're saving up a lot of work. Um, okay, so here, yeah, uh, okay, so this question uh, came up some time ago when we were like, talk, discuss, I was discussing this with another student. And so they wanted to know like, let's say I want to concatenate. So what should we do? Like, let's say that my, my point wasn't uh, like element wise addition or something, but I want to concatenate. So there is a dot concat uh, method, right? But of course you will have to do a lot of research depending on your own project, because obviously I cannot give an exhaustive list of methods here. But but this, I think, should be sufficient to get you started, right? A lot of like initial errors come from the fact that you're coming from that Python frame of mind, and then uh, this is different, right? NumPy and TensorFlow is slightly different. So this is enough, I think, to get you started, but, but yeah, you will have to do a lot of digging on your own. Another quick thing, like what happens with logical operators, so I just like wanted to show you. If like the dim dimensions of X and Y, let's say two tensors were the same, again, it's going to do a, a an element to element wise comparison, right? So here it returns a true or a false based on like every element. If you did the same to a list in Python, it would return a true only when like every element matches, otherwise it won't. But here it's doing an element wise. So you can see like these are all false. Some of them are true, right? Because they match. So for logical operators also the same rule applies essentially. Okay. So last but not the least, broadcasting mechanism. I'm sure you must have come across that term a lot and it will be used a lot uh, going forward. So both NumPy and TensorFlow use broadcasting. Mm -hmm. And again, uh, what does that mean? Uh, this, I think will, uh, I can just, so again, this is similar to what I said about like element wise uh, operations. 
But sometimes, for example, in our uh, when we were calculating, I'll show you. So what happens when we have the linear model? So you have like W transpose X uh, plus B, right? And so sometimes it's like bias is like a constant. So what we do is like we can create this, like we can calculate this dot product, right? But then, then bias has to be applied to every element in this, right? So most likely like you will have some like vector of like multiple values, let's say it has one, two, three, plus like this bias of let's say three. So what happens if this is a tensor and not like a normal Python list, right? There is like an, an, a built-in broadcasting mechanism. So what happens is that this three will be by, by default like so, uh, added to each element. That's how this is going to work. And so this works in like only two conditions. And I think I wrote down those two conditions here. Um, yeah, let's look at this example first. So here, for example, I have uh, a tensor of uh, some value. Then it has like three rows and one column. That's the first one. And then B is a tensor of uh, one row and two columns, right? So if I want to add them, what's going to happen is that if any of the dimension is like one, then broadcasting is invoked usually. So what, what will happen in this case is that this three is going to replicate itself to match the columns. And this thing is going to replicate itself to match the rows in the other tensor. So basically we will be able to add them, like believe it or not. So let me just create these first, okay? And if I add them, now notice what happened if I added them. Uh, now imagine that this like this first one is like zero, one, two, and then there is another column with zero, one, two, right? And also imagine that this, this second one has like three zero ones. So then they have the same shape, right? And then they, they can be added. And so that's the result that I'm getting here. So sometimes when you're doing this like addition, multiple, like all these operations between two uh, tensors, just know that this broadcasting can be invoked. And it is like a, a really beneficial for like a lot of cases, right? So I have like this uh, a link that talks more about broadcasting in NumPy arrays. So you can just go and check that. It talks like about the details. Although like the, the thing that I like to remember is that if they are equal, then broadcasting is obviously invoked. But if one of them is like one, it doesn't have like uh, anything up, uh, above, like the mismatch is only because of that one, then broadcasting is, is invoked, otherwise not. So that's like a good high level idea to remember. Okay, so please go and check this. This is like really, really uh, useful. So that was more about like, how will we start working with our data? How will we uh, do the data manipulation and just like, Take your time, try to understand either NumPy or TensorFlow. My recommendation is understand TensorFlow better because that is going to stay with you. So uh, yeah, so that, that's that. Um, okay, any questions so far? Okay, if you have questions like when I provide these links, right, to anything, and if you go and read it, and you have questions, you can post on the discussion forum and I can answer there as well because I understand that like this is a lot of information I give you in a session and it's like sometimes difficult to absorb right then and there. So when you go back and you have questions, feel free to post on the discussion forum. Because I think that's even better. Like every like other people can answer, you can answer somebody else's question. I can come in and answer, so that's, that's good. Okay, so another thing that's important uh, for any machine learning project is data pre-processing. And the library that's used for that is pandas. I'm sure many of you are familiar with that term, many of you have worked with it, and that's excellent. So again, I've provided the official pandas documentation. Let me show you, go here, go to documentation. And I think you have like all these guides. I think user guide is enough. It gives you like a lot of information on how to get started with pandas. Uh, like high level things where you use pandas more is going to be, uh, what happened? Yeah, high level where you'll be using pandas is reading in the data and visualizing things, visualizing some like handling missing data. Those are the things where you'll be using pandas the most, right? So again, I have like some getting started kind of examples here, but that's, this is not exhaustive in any ways. So the first thing is whenever, obviously you will have some data set stored somewhere else and you'll be reading it into your uh, Polab, let's say notebook, right? 
So pandas comes in uh, here. You can do import pandas. And most likely, you don't need to do this installation here. It, you just import it uh, on Colab. You don't need to do that. And there are these like different methods using which you can read your files. So one word of caution here, and I wanted to show you this. So I don't have this train file here, right? So if you go to files, you'll have to either upload the file here, or another way is that you can upload it to your Google Drive and then mount that drive here. So then you don't have to upload it again and again. But either option is available. So for example, let me upload a file here. So I'm going to upload uh, train. OK, so it, it's already telling me that once you just like close this notebook, it will be gone, right? So you'll have to upload it again. So I uploaded it, and then I'm going to run it, right? So now it's running fine. Otherwise, it gives an error that it's like file is not found. Now, as I said, going back to or like you don't want to upload it again and again, just save it in your Google Drive, right? And then just like click this button here. If you just so this will like be this notebook will be able to access all my files. So I don't have to upload again and again then it's just there, right? So this is a small thing. And maybe like going forward, if you're using Kaggle as your source of data, then there is like even a better way of like connecting Kaggle to this. Uh, there is this, like for every data set, Kaggle, uh, Kaggle, if you go to the settings, it provides you with a kind of a token that you have to upload on your Google Drive and it pulls the data from there directly, right? So just like remind me if you're using that, I can point you to the link of how to connect that. But it's like very easy. You don't have to download or upload anything. If it's a huge data set, you usually don't like to like download it on your computers, right? So then you don't have to just connect it directly to that. Okay, so that's that. Uh, right, so I already mounted that, that's fine. Now, other important things about this. Uh, one very important aspect of any machine learning project is that once you have the data in, you should do some exploratory data analysis. So what is that? Well, first of all, you go and check if are there any missing values, right? So I, I just picked this data from Kaggle again, and this is the housing prices, the famous housing prices data set where you're predicting the house price given some input, right? So it has like a lot of features as you can see here. And if we just like keep scrolling, right? You will see some NAs, right? NANs, right? So these are missing values. And if you're using this, like this features in some way, right? If you're using that, uh, then this NANs are going to interfere with your processing and, and other things, right? So there are many ways of handling this missing data. For example, like this is a categorical uh, data, uh, uh, sorry, feature type, right? So it doesn't have like numeric values. So there are many ways of handling that. There is something that's known as one hot encoding that sometimes you do. There are different methods of, of dealing with this, right? So let's say this, this value was missing, right? So this is not a numeric value. One way of dealing with this is if this, this was just like one value missing, I will just like eliminate this, this uh, example because I have like enough data, so I'll just eliminate it. But sometimes what happens is that a lot of values are missing and you don't want to like, just by deleting that entire example, you don't want to miss out on all that information for other features. Otherwise, like it's a waste, right? So there are ways of dealing with, with it. Like if it's a numeric value, sometimes you calculate the average of the values that are already there and then uh, like give this uh, one, th like the missing one, that average. That could be one. Sometimes if you see a lot of outliers in your data, so then obviously data visualization comes in, then like updating a, like a missing value with an average is not a good idea because it's going to give you some extreme value, right? So maybe looking at the median might help that. So those kind of things. So again, there are many ways of handling missing data. And this is how you check whether like there is any missing data or not, like dot is NA. And there are other methods of like checking and then filling those NA values uh, with different things. So again, this is how we hand, like handle missing data. And again, what are the values that are considered missing and how do we deal with them? This article talks like uh, in a great amount of detail because you will definitely need this. I know that every data set has this issue. So whenever you start working with any data set, this is the, the main, uh, this should be your main concern. Like just go and check what the data looks like. Does it have a lot of outliers? Does it have a lot of missing values? How to deal with them? Because your data, you have to really prepare your data well for your machine learning algorithm because the algorithm itself is not going to deal with these issues and you're going to get like some 
biased outcomes or some biased results. So like, again, like maybe I'm repeating myself a lot, but data pre-processing is as important as implementing your model, as getting your model ready and getting the results, right? Okay, so what happens to this? Okay, yeah, so that's that. So again, like I just wanted to give you an overview why this is important. Uh, you will do some exploratory data analysis in homework one. So it has a, like a section wherein you will be doing that. So you will get like enough practice is what I'm saying. Uh, okay. Questions, any comments, anything? Okay, people who are online, if you have any questions, please feel free to put it in the chat. Uh, so I don't see anything in the chat. That means we are good. So let's keep going. The last thing I think I wanted to talk about before we move on to um, yeah, logistic regression again is about vectors. So I think we all are on the same page and we know that we're talking about vectors whenever we're talking about X. Whenever I talk about input, we know that I'm, I'm not talking about some single feature, I'm talking about multiple features. And so most likely like in any machine learning problem, uh, examples from the, in math notation, these are like these bold X, Y, Z vectors, right? And this is helpful, why? Because, and, and obviously we understand what X sub I is. So X sub I is going to be one value from that vector, right? So why is this important? Well, this is important uh, because uh, we are working with tensors in the very first place. And so we will be using some vector related operations when we are working with tensors. So why do we do that? So this section is a demonstration of why we need to use vector operations versus what we've been doing until now, right? So there is this notion of efficiency, especially when you're working with large data sets. And you really want your code to be efficient because you don't want, want it to run like forever, right? And so there are ways of like, uh, we saw two of them, like vector, uh, we saw broadcasting, we saw how operators work, right? So that already makes your code efficient. In addition to that, there are like these uh, methods that are available with both NumPy and TensorFlow that can make your uh, computation fast. Okay, so even before like jumping into this, I wanted to time like two ways of calculating this part. So again, I'll go back to, so remember like in any like linear model, you'll be calculating this dot product, right? So from our current knowledge of Python, let's say we are not familiar with NumPy and we're not familiar with TensorFlow, right? The way I can do this is that I'm going to create, like uh, this is going to be some, uh, like set of ways that are unknown, right? And so I'll begin with like some initial parameters. And then I have this X, which is like my data, right? And so I'll create a, like a, I, I need to calculate a dot product of these two, right? So from my current knowledge, I'm going to write a for loop, right? And pick like every element and a corresponding element here, right? And I will just like do a, a sum and product, sum of the products, right? And I'll keep running that for every element. So think about the complexity of this, uh, if we are doing that in a loop, right? So these operations like this dot product and other such operations like summing up and finding the sum product have been optimized already in these packages like NumPy and TensorFlow. Okay, so I just want to show you again a small example of how we can do that. Uh, okay, so here I am just like demonstrating how to use NumPy. I'm sure everybody uh, is familiar with that. Just like import NumPy and then just go and create a NumPy array. Now this is the example I'm talking about. I have implemented a vectorized version of the calculating the dot product of W and X and a non-vectorized version. And then I'm timing them because I just wanted to like demonstrate why we, we don't want to use loops anymore. Okay, so this is the first one. I'm importing time, right? I created this like NumPy array A of like, uh, I don't know, 1 million something, right? Six zeros, yes. And B is the same size, so I just like calculated, uh, I just created these random uh, values in there. Okay, so now what I want to do is I want to create, uh, ca uh, calculate the dot product of A and B. Okay, so it's very simple. So here is the vectorized version, and I'm like starting my time dot time, obviously. And the way you do it is a single line of code, numpy dot dot. That's it, and, and we're done. And it's the same in TensorFlow, like tf dot dot, and you're done with the dot product. And let's see like what, what time it takes, right? So I'm just like printing out the time and that's it, right? So let me not print C, I don't want to see that yet. Okay, so as you can see, uh, 0 0.0016 milliseconds. 
that's pretty efficient given the size of the input. But let's like do the non-vectorized version. Uh, quickly, uh, what I'm doing in the non-vectorized version is like writing a for loop and accumulating the values and sum them up, right? So let me just run this as well. Okay, so there is a huge difference uh, between this and this. You can just tell by looking at the, the value. And, and by the way, we're gonna get the same value here as well. So if I just like print C, right? So it is two, four. Oh, okay, so because we have like this random uh, thing, now they are the same, right? So the whole point I'm trying to make here is that there is a huge difference between these optimized versions of the existing packages, like when we're using those vector uh, methods versus like if you're writing our own. So try avoid like avoiding writing loops, especially for loops. That's like golden rule number one whenever working with large data sets. Because you can just like see this is this was a very small calculation, but look at the, the difference in, in, in time. Yeah. And that's why we have like these uh, these different methods available with NumPy and uh, TensorFlow. So yeah. Uh, Yes, again, this section also talks about GPUs again. And this is just like I'm running it in Google Colab and I'm not using any fancy hardware here. It's just like the normal. And still we see a lot of difference, right? And so with GPUs, you're going to see that it is going to be a huge advantage to us when we start working with like huge data sets, right? So again, we will keep discussing these GPUs as we go further and when will we need them? That's also an important question, but right now we don't. But I just like want to keep talking about it so that like when you start working with it, it's not like a surprise, uh, doesn't come as a surprise. So basically the fundamental idea here is that it, it, it offers a parallel uh, processing like way uh, behind uh, like behind the scenes. That, that's what makes it so efficient. Okay. Uh, all right, again, there is this article uh, where, that talks about difference between GPU and CPU. Whenever you have time, just go and look at it. As I said, for the next three to four weeks, we need not worry too much about it. So that's that's that. All right. So because I talked about this, like vectorizing and these like these different dot uh, functions that are available with NumPy and TensorFlow, let's actually look at like how can we use that in like logistic regression and how will it make it like really simple. Okay, so the like this this is just like copied from the previous lecture. So we already know what we have to do here. So this is this is going to be my predicted value. Uh, sigma is the sigmoid, right? And then based on the values, I'm going to get a probability value, and then I'm going to predict given like some historical data, right? So this is my loss and this is my cost function, right? And the way like the computation will happen is that you're going to calculate this value for every example, right? So because you have a WI transpose XI plus D, you're going to do that for all of them. And then you're going to save them in a vector A. So this like A1 is for the first one, A2 is for the second one, AN is for the last one, right? So this is actually giving you a high level idea of how you should be implementing logistic regression. And this is important because you will be doing that in your homework one. So this is how you should like proceed. And then once you have like these values, obviously you will have to find, you have to minimize the loss, minimize the cost, not the loss, right? And to do that, right? So to implement that, you will have the cost function and then you will implement gradient descent. So again, uh, you have the input X. A, I'm defining it as the A, like the big A for all the examples, right? And so these small A's are representing like for every example, I have an A, right? So everybody is okay with like what A is, right? And then we already talked about the cost function for these type of problems where you're predicting uh, probabilities, right? So this is the log loss function, the cross entropy sometimes called the cross entropy loss. And so this is the cost because I'm like taking the entire data set, right? The average of that. So now what, what gradient descent does? Just like quickly refreshing our memories, what does gradient descent do? Well, I have this like loss, uh, this cost surface, right? And I'm trying to find the derivative of the cost function with respect to the parameters that I'm trying to predict, right? Or estimate using the data, right? And so in my, like this problem, those parameters are the weights. So that's the W, right? And the bias, right? So from your knowledge of um, calculus, 
if you go and like differentiate this function with respect to the weight and with respect to the bias, this is what you get. And you can just like go and verify. But here I just wanted to demonstrate that this is what's happening like step by step, right? Now let's say I don't have any packages for like, there is a scikit-learn package in Python that just like does scikit-learn and then import something and then logistic regression and I'm done, right? Let's say I don't have that. And uh, I'm pointing you to like homework one because that's what I want you to do in the very first place. I know that that package exists, but like the first time you're implementing logistic regression, go step by step, do every step yourself. And of course, like you can use the dot uh, methods that are available in NumPy and TensorFlow, okay? So these are the steps. I'll find the derivative, right? And once I found the derivative, I need to keep these calculations somewhere, right? Because I'll be using them for the update rule. Okay, so here, like I've commented out this code and this is like high level telling you what exactly you'll be doing when you write the code. So this is not like everything, but this is enough to give you an idea of what you will be doing here, right? Let's say you have the sigmoid function that already exists. So I'm assuming you already wrote how to calculate sigmoid. Just like write that fraction, right? That's that's sufficient. And then the input the sigmoid takes, uh, if you go back here, is this. W transpose x plus b. That's the first thing you'll be doing, right? And you can do it in NumPy by doing an np dot dot. Dot dot just calculates the dot product of w dot transpose. So believe it or not, it's as simple. If w is like a NumPy array, right? You can just like do a dot uh, uppercase t and that will calculate the transpose. So you don't again have to worry about anything. And then by broadcasting, this b will be added to this, right? So that's in one, in one step, you got this, right? You got your a, right? And then calculate the cost. You already have the formula. So I just like wrote, wrote down in terms of like, how to use np.sum, np.log. It's as simple, right? You don't have to write loops for everything and just calculate for every element. Just do, just apply that method. That's it. So once you have the cost, and then you calculate these gradients, right? This The first one, so I just named that gradient dw because this is with respect to weights. And then I just named this as db because this was with respect to b, the bias. And just like notice how we can do this. Because again, this is just like a dot product of X and A minus Y, right? And then this is like the sum of the, the, like the difference between the elements averaged. And again, like I'm repeating, you can just go in and uh, calculate the derivative of this with respect to the weights and, and bias. You will see that this is what you get, okay? So this is just like showing you how like within four steps or maximum five, because maybe you'll have a sigmoid function that you will have to write. You're done with all these, calculations. Now imagine if we weren't using NumPy and TensorFlow, NumPy or TensorFlow, this is like a, I don't know, a, a huge script in Python, right? Because yeah, you already know that. So yeah. Okay. So then once we're done with all these calculations, we have the famous update step because you have to update the parameters and see it's minimum or for some iterations you're going to run. Let's say I decided I'm running for 1000. So this is the first step, right? And then in the update step, you will be applying this update. So this, this theta that I'm using here is actually, it applies both for my weights and my bias. So this is any parameter that you are uh, trying to update. That's it, right? So again, here you will, like in this part, in the update part, you will basically be doing two steps, just two steps. Uh, that is like, you will be based on your learning rate and whatever DW and DB you calculated here, you will be up updating your weights and bias. That's it, right? You have some learning rate eta, you multiply it with the, the um, derivatives that you calculated for every i, right? And they, those will be saved in some, some vector type array or something, right? And so all you have to do is just like multiply the learning rate, learning rate will be multiplied to each one of them because broadcasting, right? And you get the updated weights and bias. And then maybe you wanted to run it for 1000 times or 10,000 times, I don't know, because you have to decide that, right? And then eventually you get your final W and B. And then the final step, which is the most important step is obviously you'll, you'll need it to predict something that's unknown, right? And so the way you predict that is that you have these Ws and Bs, right? So you will do some calculations now. You'll go back and calculate it for whatever values you wanted to calculate. There will be some, some, some test data or something, right? So you will have to calculate and then you will uh, check this. And if you want, you can check the, the accuracy or uh, whatever metric you're using. 
So all of that, those details are given in the homework, but I still wanted to like go over these steps so that you're not like stuck with like writing the entire script because we don't have to do that anymore, right? It's, it's very simple now as we move on. Although we are not using um, any package for logistic regression yet, we will be using that going forward. So that is just like three to four lines of code, not even this. But the first homework really like asks you to implement these steps because we really want to understand gradient descent well. And reason being, then only we'll be able to understand neural networks well. So that's why I want uh, everybody to like understand this. Uh, okay. Questions, doubts? Okay, this is a repeat from the previous lecture, so uh, I don't think it should be that hard. But if it is, as I said, feel free to post your question on the discussion forum and I can answer that. So that's, I know that you're gonna have questions when you start implementing. So then feel free to post your questions. Okay, one thing to remember that like going forward, right now we're using an activation function. So think about like this linear model, right? So you have some, some data coming in and then you're assuming that the output is related to the input through that linear function, right? But in this case, we wanted to predict probability. So we said, I apply an activation on this. So I applied the sigmoid on this. If you think about it, it's like, if you have uh, come across neural network design, you know that this is very similar to the perceptron. This is actually the perceptron in a lot of ways, right? Except that it, it depends on what activation I use. So sometimes when you're, you're using yes, no type of prediction, you can use an act a sign function as an activation function, right? Sign means like plus one or minus one, right? So which class uh, does it lie? Or you can use the identity function as the activation. For example, in a regression, linear regression problem. It, it's an identity function, nothing changes. It's just the sum of the input, right? And similarly, in this case, it's sigmoid. Now, we are not restricted to only these three choices. We have more and we will be using other uh, activation functions when we start working with more complex problems. So this is a nice article that talks about like these activation functions. And again, you don't need them right away, but you will need them going forward. So this is the linear one. Uh, this is like the uh, identity one. This is the sigmoid, right? And so we know that we can restrict our output within zero and one, so that's why we're using sigmoid. Now, it's not just like, uh, uh, sigmoid is a popular choice for logistic regression, not just for this, but for something else. And that is related to our loss function, right? And what did we do with the loss function? Like when we were uh, doing the, just before the update step, yes. Exactly, right? So then think about this, like uh, whatever activation you're using, it has to be differentiable. Otherwise it's going to create issues with gradient descent. And the thing is that like, gradient descent is the most popular uh, algorithm used to like optimize these, these problems, right? And so it becomes difficult, especially if you're using the sine function, for example. Think about sine. If you're using sine, it is going, it's, it's not going to create a differentiable like sort of loss uh, function, but rather a stepwise uh, kind of like, it's going to be a step five because it's like a zero or a one. So it's not differentiable, gradient descent doesn't work well with that, right? So we have ways of, of dealing with those kind of problems as well. And so there is like this choice of uh, an, like uh, activation function. So the other one is tan edge. In many problems we use tan edge. Think of tan edge as like the sigmoid, just like uh, instead of restrict, restricting it between zero and one, I'm like taking it from minus one to one. Because in many problems it makes sense right? Because what happens in logistic regression is that they're like negative and positive values, the negative ones are like all zeros. And so it might interfere with the way we want to look at the output. And so we use tan edge then. And then another one that we will be using a lot, and this is like one of the most popular activation functions in neural networks, and that that's this rectified linear unit or ReLU, right? And it, it like, it makes a lot of computation faster because like, look at this here. The, the max is like zero and Z. So the input and the output are like kind of linear, right? But everything that's negative goes to zero. So it's it's good, it's faster computation, but sometimes, sometimes this, this creates issues because let's say I wanted to do something with those negative values and it's like giving zero for all of them. And so there is an option for that and that's known as the leaky ReLU. So we, uh, we provide some kind of slope in there instead of like making it zero we give some value to this negative uh, uh, slope, right? So again, as I said, I'm introducing things like 
in uh, I would say installments. So I'm just like introducing this like at the surface. We are going to dig deeper when we actually start working with them, right? But I still wanted to introduce so that it's not like something new when it comes up. Again, like if you have time, go and check this uh, link. Uh, all right. So the the second part of today's lecture is is to read this paper. And this is, I think, uh, really, really important for us, and especially because we will be implementing uh, gradient descent in homework one. So I really wanted to read this, uh, but maybe we can take a five minute break and get started because this is like, this has some math in there. And so can be like exhausting. <laughs> so let's take a five minutes break and then we get started with this. We don't have a lecture on Tuesday, right? Tuesday is Monday's schedule. Okay, so that's going to be a problem because I have something. Okay, I'll try to. Uh, because we, uh, I decided to cover tree based methods next week, but then we have only one lecture next week.
Okay, so then let's get started. Uh, as was discussed earlier, like on day one, that we will be reading papers throughout and like whatever topic we are covering related to that. So this is like a very nice, like uh, well-cited paper that talks about gradient descent, like different versions that exist and how to optimize gradient descent because there are some problems that exist depending on the problem we are solving. So uh, we know that gradient descent is an optimization algorithm that's used to find, especially like for convex optimization type problems, we are able to find um, a global minimum or a, a global maximum. Now, as I said, if you're using packages like scikit-learn, you don't really get to see gradient descent as much because it's like just embedded in your logistic regression model and, and it just like comes up there, right? So it's used as a black box most of the time. So it's really important for us to understand uh, this because we are not just like calling a package and then like using it to get results, but we really want to understand why we are getting these results, right? So we need to understand gradient descent. And also because this gradient descent uh, forms an inherent part of all uh, deep learning packages that you'll be using going forward, right? So of course, I won't ask you to implement gradient descent from scratch for deep learning, but it's easier to do that for logistic uh, regression. And then once you understand that, I think that's that's okay, right? Then then that's it. So as I said, it's like one of the more popular uh, algorithms for optimization. It's a way to minimize any objective function. So let me make it bigger. Okay, so it's a way to uh, minimize any objective function, which in our uh, problem, in any machine learning problem, is to minimize the cost function. That's our optimization problem, like regardless of whatever problem we are solving, right? We really want to come close to the, the my predicted values should, should come as close as possible to the actual values, right? So that's why this is so popular. And the way we do that is that we, we try to minimize uh, the, 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 the cost function by uh, estimating the parameters or updating the parameters in the opposite direction of the gradient of the objective function. So then again, the big assumption here is that there is convexity somewhere, the error surface or the, the cost surface is uh, convex, right? And we are like within that uh, like space, the parameter space, we are updating such that we're moving in the direction that, that is negative to the gradient, which means we are moving towards the minimum, right? And of course, like you visualize that, just think of that as like a convex surface and like you start at any point and then iteratively you're moving towards the minimum. So that's the fundamental idea. right? Uh, okay, so there are different versions of like, or different variants of gradient descent. The very basic one is the batch gradient descent that I talked about in the very first lecture. So what exactly are we doing in this like batch gradient descent or sometimes also known as the vanilla gradient descent, right? What we're doing in the update rule is that I'm calculating the gradient. So remember these two uh, equations here in our problem, right? So these are the gradients that we need, right? So what we're doing here is that we are calculating the gradient for the entire data set. Because here what you're doing is this J is our L actually. So in this paper, they're, they're calling it J, but it's L uh, in the notation that we've been using, right? So I'm calculating the gradient for the entire data set in, in, in just like once, right? And so once I calculate this, when I do this update, this is just my one iteration. So I moved one step further by taking the entire data set, calculating the gradient for that cost function, and then moved in that direction, updated. So as you can tell, if this data set was huge, let's say it has like 1 million examples or, or instances, then this is like pretty inefficient. Like for one iteration of your gradient descent, you just like process the entire data set and then you're moving forward, right? So this is, that, that, that's the whole problem here. And so this is the pseudo code for this, right? So for loop, for the number of epochs, we call them epochs, the, the number of iterations that you wanted to run for. and Every time you do that, you, you make this update for the entire data set. So this batch gradient descent is a very slow version of gradient descent. And usually in practice, we don't use it anymore. This is only for theoretical purposes. So what do we use, right? So one thing that we've been starting, like more, many other, many algorithms, uh, many models use is stochastic gradient descent or SGD, right? So how is it different uh, from batch gradient descent? Let's look at it. So it's different in the update rule, right? So look at this update rule here. This is my update rule, right? Theta equals theta minus 
this learning parameter, learning rate times the gradient, right? And notice like I'm, I'm, I'm saying that this gradient is a function of x of x i and y i. And remember this i is pointing to the examples. So what I'm doing here is that I'm picking one example, calculating the gradient of the cost with respect to that example only. And then whatever update I get, I make that update for, for the entire problem and then move. So of course, this will make my computation faster because I'm just doing it for one example, right? But then you can think of this as like this data set is huge, obviously. And so I might not be like in, in the very first few iterations or first hundred iterations or some, some number of iterations, I might not be moving in the right direction, right? But if, Eventually I do, and this has been like proved in many other uh, papers in many other research papers that it does. It does really well in terms of like finding the actual minimum, right? But the issue here is that it fluctuates a lot. Now you can tell why it fluctuates a lot because many times it just like moves away from the global uh, minimum because I am finding the gradient for one example only, right? So it doesn't have the information for the entire data set. And so that's why there is a lot of like fluctuation, but like performance wise, it does really well. It, it performs really well as compared to my batch gradient descent, right? So this is an improved version regardless of like how much it jumps. And also like uh, this this is known to find better like uh, minimum values. So for example, it gets uh, sometimes, it does not get stuck as much in the local minima as the uh, batch gradient descent, right? So it works really well that way. And here is the pseudo code for this. Might be helpful when you're implementing your own stochastic gradient descent, right? Okay, so this actually shows what really happens in stochastic gradient descent. Now look at like how it is fluctuating, how it is like moving away. So we have to come come like really low here, right? So this is like, let's say the, the loss that we're looking at, right? So we're really trying to minimize that. And these are the iterations here. And look at the fluctuations that happen. So sometimes it just like moves away from the minimum, but eventually, Actually, it's known, it's, it has shown uh, with different data types, with different data sets that it does achieve a good result. And you will see that yourself when you implement it uh, in, in, in your homework. So that's that. And then obviously there is one that's known as mini batch gradient descent that takes the best of both worlds. So it's not taking the entire data set at once, but it's not taking just one example at once. It is taking batches, right? So then what will happen is in this, this equation actually tells us that, right? So just notice this gradient is calculated with respect to the parameters, but notice this I and this, this Y, right? So it, these are like slices of data. That's like batches of, of, of your data set. So of course, this will help in reducing the fluctuations that you're getting here. It makes it more robust, it makes it more stable, but it's not bad in terms of like the time it takes to uh, converge. Why? Because obviously I'm not taking the entire data set. And the usual I think is to take between 500 to 200 uh, sized uh, like batches and then go from there. And so you randomly pick batches from the data. So sometimes obviously you'll have like repeated values, but then that, that sometimes helps, sometimes it is a challenge, but usually it helps, right? And then you just like keep updating the parameters and then you eventually reach the minimum. Sometimes there are two versions of like mini, um, this ba mini batch gradient descent. Sometimes you pick the uh, examples in a sequence. So that's also done many times, but sometimes it's like randomly picked. So either ways you'll have to compare depending on the problem that you're working on. Okay. So these are the three major, I would say, um, variants of gradient descent. Uh, the first one batch, then the second one stochastic, and the third one is mini batch gradient descent. And uh, there are other vari variants also there. And if you just like go and read research papers, you'll see that there are others, but these are the, the basic ones. The rest of them like build on these. Okay. So then coming to the challenges with these, especially the stochastic gradient descent and also the mini batch. So of course we have solved one issue of like efficiency, right? We've solved that with these, but then there are other issues that exist. For example, what about that learning rate, that eta that exists? whether we should be taking it, taking that as a big value or a small value, right? That is a, a huge problem because if you take a very small value, let me like make you visualize that. I think we talked about that last time as well. So let's say this is my, my uh, function, right? 
and I started somewhere here and I'm moving uh, towards the negative of the gradient. So in this direction, right? And those steps, like those eta values are going to decide like how big or small the steps are going to be in every iteration, right? So if it's a, like a, if eta was like really, let's say small, right? So they're going to be like really small steps. And then you can tell that the time it is going to take to converge is going to like be really small, right? So let's say, okay, let them then let's take large steps. Why not, right? So we're on, yeah, true. Uh, so if you're taking these large steps, sometimes what happens is it just like misses the actual minimum because they are too large. So they are obviously going to come closer to this and then maybe not find the global minimum. So that's the issue with too large. So this is an important consideration whenever you're implementing gradient descent, very important consideration in fact. So there is a way of like dealing with that. So how about we take a variable uh, eta, right? And so when you decide to take a variable eta, then you have to have a, a technique or a methodology to uh, come up with what is that variable? I'm, I'm just saying that take variable maybe, but how and, and how to implement that. So we are going to come to that, and there are many optimization algorithms that, that answer that. The other issue, I think, is when data is sparse. So this point number three. So while I'm giving you like important points from this paper, the, uh, from the perspective of like practical implications, right? So maybe we're skipping some part, but like things that are important, I feel I'm giving you those, right? So the other thing is that if your data is sparse, that means you have a lot of missing data, and then you have a lot of, uh, uh, features that don't have any values. That's what sparse is. Now think about like when we are making the updates, think about uh, the, the derivative value, right? So when the update happens, right? Usually what happens is that it's going to create an issue when features have very different frequencies, right? So think about like uh, some class that is not there to like, we don't have too many values of a particular class in the data set. Right? So whenever we encounter that class, a very big update will be applied to that. Right? So that is an issue in some ways. And so that's that's another problem that, that exists with stochastic gradient descent and mini batch gradient descent. That's that's a big issue. And then the very important, I would say that the third important practical uh, perspective challenge is the issue of saddle points. So saddle points, uh, I'm sure if you've taken uh, optimization classes, you're familiar, like the mini max point that you, you you encountered a local minimum. There is no better point in the vicinity of that, but then there there exists a global minimum somewhere. But you're just like algorithm cannot find, so it just like stops there. And obviously, you can tell just by thinking and visualizing about it that it to a certain extent depends on your step size, because that's why you just like stop there because in the the vicinity of that point there is no, there's nowhere to go. Okay, so these are the three important challenges for any gradient descent algorithm. And so obviously people have come up with solutions to the, these problems. So the very first solution, and these are known as gradient descent optimization algorithms. And let me tell you from the perspective of like practical application, there are two most popular ones. Uh, I'm sure maybe you've come across those. The first one is RMS prop, and the second one is Adams uh, algorithm. Maybe you've come up, uh, Come across those in papers and in other uh, like yeah other articles. So those are the two more most important ones. But here we are covering more than more than like those two. And those two are also there here. Okay. So momentum is the first one, and momentum is a very simple way of dealing with these fluctuations in your stochastic gradient descent. Like this is actually saying that you are like literally like if you have a ball that you're rolling on a surface you're providing it with something that like lets it gain momentum. It's, it's as simple as that. So what we do is that in the update uh, rule, when we're doing the update, so remember like this is, this is what the update rule looks like, right? So we did theta equals theta minus uh, like this thing, right? But now I'm also adding some other value to this, right? So what, what I'm doing is I'm adding like a fraction of this like this gamma or the um, or some input momentum constant. And how does that help? Well, that helps because I'm also taking the gradients from some previous steps. So basically I'm utilizing the information from the previous steps and giving those some momentum so that it takes me to the right direction. Because maybe in some previous steps, I figured that this was the direction, but because like I'm using every new uh, data point as like for the update, that's why I just like keep moving in different directions. 
So if I just like get some information from some of the previous steps, then I'm good, right? I, I'm able to move towards this. Right, so this is like uh, a very simple way of dealing with the fluctuations that happen in stochastic gradient descent. So this makes it more robust. This is the first one. Uh, okay, so this idea actually is used in a lot of other optimization algorithms as well, and I'm going to talk about those in greater detail. I wanted to give you this idea here, stochastic gradient descent with momentum, because this is the, the fundamental building block for many of the other algorithms. Okay. So I'm going to skip this one. If you're interested, you should go in and like, uh, read through this because again, as I said, I'm focusing on the ones that are like more prominent in like practice. So I'm just like going to skip this one. Uh, okay, so the, the ADA grad or the adaptive uh, gradient descent is an important one. So an, a lot of other algorithms are built on this one, right? And so for example, even the Adams, the most popular optimization algorithm is also built on this one. Right. So let's try to understand what's uh, like happening here. Uh, let's say you have like, and, and by the way, this this is I think used in a lot of like um, a lot of neural network applications at Google as well. And uh, to be specific, Google uses Adams more than than any other, and that is again built on this Ada grad. So what this is saying at the heart of this is that instead of like using a, a like a learning rate that's a constant, why don't we make it like uh, like a f as a factor of some other uh, information that we had from the previous steps, right? Why don't we be like make it um, have some information from the previous steps as well, rather than just like making it a constant only and calculating the gradient at that point only? Okay, what does that mean? So here they're introducing this gradient, uh, this g t of i. So notice this t actually is a time step. So for every iteration, think of this time step as an iteration, right? For every iteration with, for like example, I, I'm going to calculate this, right? Update this. And what will happen is that I'm going to multiply this, like the, the previous gradients, all the information of the previous steps to this, this eta. Okay, so I think maybe this one makes it clear what's happening here. So look at this equation, right? Earlier, earlier what we had was just this, let me, Right, so I know that this, this term already has the gradient information for this particular time step that I just calculated, right? But I'm saying, why am I discarding the previous uh, calculations? Why not use them, right? So I'm going to use the, the, the information from the previous steps as well. So the way to use them and then just like make it mathematically convenient is to put like, to have this diagonal matrix where every element, I, I, is going to be the sum of squares of the gradients with, with respect to the parameter that you're looking at up to that time step. So that means this has the information of all the previous time steps. That's why we are saying that this update is t plus one. So let's say in this in the the update in the t plus one -th step, which is like let's say it's the tenth step, right? I'm also going to take the information of all the steps until the ninth one, not just like this current step. And I'm going to somehow uh, put that in this with this value, right? So I, I'll definitely have an eta here which is going to be a constant, but then that also depends on what gradients I got in the previous steps. So these are this is the square of the gradients of all the, uh, like with respect to the parameters that I calculated earlier, right? And so this is going to help me make my solution more robust because obviously that information shouldn't be lost because in stochastic gradient descent, I'm just like taking one example at a time and just like not caring about the information that I had earlier, right? And as you can tell, like, this is the square of the gradients. And so that's why you have a square root plus this term, because sometimes we can get like zero gradients, right? And so we don't want a zero division error. So we have like a small epsilon just to uh, deal with that, right? And this, the square root is to deal with, like we have, if you think about the dimensionality of everything, this is a gradient, right? This is a gradient. And then this is the square root of the square of the gradient. So they're pretty much the same thing. Right, and so nothing changes is what I'm saying here, right? So this is like the, the most basic way of dealing with this. Of course, this has issues. Of course, this thing has issues and we're gonna like discuss those as well, right? Because this is talking about like, how will we do a matrix like multiplication between this GT and T? I think I gave you a high level idea of how that is happening, right? But what happened like, and this uh, really like sums it up well, 
uh, the biggest drawback of this approach is that you can have like a lot of uh, like accumulation of these squared gradients at the denominator. This term is going to like blow up at some point. It's going to become like really big. And then not a lot of update is happening. So eventually it's going to slow down. So then again, we are back to our original problem of like slow updates, right? So how do, do we uh, improve on that, right? So there is one way of improving uh, here. And so that's what this eta delta uh, does. And so all these uh, uh, algorithms that I'm going to talk about, they work on this idea only. So nothing fancy beyond this, as long as you understand this, the rest of the steps, uh, like the rest of the algorithms are just like an improvised version of that uh, ADA grad, right? So this, this one is saying that, okay, let me do this. Um, let me not take like the, uh, like all the information from all the previous updates but rather let me take the expected value of the square of like all some previous updates, right? And that's this. And maybe take the, the immediate uh, update that I'm doing right now in this iteration as well. Take both of them and then do some kind of a, an average of these. Think about it, this, this gamma here, let's say this gamma is 0.9, right? So I'm getting some weightage to the, the expected squared Square of all the gradients of some previous iterations. And then I'm giving some weightage to my current iteration as well. Think about it, just like take a, a second. And so instead of like just taking this, the direct sum of squares of all the previous iterations, the gradients, all those gradients, and like the current one and multiplying them, I'm going to give some weightage to, to each one of them. And now it depends on me what weightage I'm going to give. Maybe depending on my problem domain, I'm going to give more weightage to my current one and less to the previous ones, or maybe more weightage to, my, to the previous one and less, uh, less to the current one, depending on the problem. But this is like a weighted average of all the previous gradient, gradients plus the current one. That's it, right? So this actually helps a lot. And this gamma is known as the momentum term. So it's usually set to 0.9. For most problems, it works well with, with that 0.9 value, right? So that's what we're doing. Instead of like this G sub T, I'm going to do the expected value of like G squared T, which we just defined here, right? And this is going to uh, make my, uh, like it, it won't go down to zero because you have this expectation of, uh, sorry, it won't like blow up because I have this like way of capturing the expectation in such a way that I can um, give weightage to that, right? So it, it's not going to accumulate as such because I can decide what is my gamma. And based on that, I, I, I will not let it accumulate. Thinking about, let's just think about that. And then if you like mathematically speaking, this is nothing but the root mean squared error of the gradient, right? And so that's why that's where this RMS comes from. So instead of like writing this entire big equation, we just like call it RMS, that's it. I know that's a lot of information. It's a research paper. And that's why I'm giving you high level. We are not going into the math uh, and the details of that. I'm just like giving you a high level idea. And that's how we'll be reading research papers in class. If you're interested in like greater detail, go back, read it, have questions, come back with the questions. If that's something that, that makes sense, right? Because like the first time you look at it, it is going to be overwhelming. So if it is overwhelming, that's absolutely normal, so to say. <laughs> okay. So that's that's how we can improvise on that. And eventually, so let me just like skip all of this because we're not going into the details of this derivation. Eventually, the this is what the update looks like, which is like, if you look at it, it's independent of my eta. It's ind independent of the eta value. So I don't give that. Rather, I based everything on the previous gradients and the current gradient. That's all this is talking about, right? And as I said, like in the beginning, when we started discussing these algorithms, I said the most popular one is RMS prop, uh, which is like very similar to what we did here. So this is the one that's used like industry-wide, I would say people use like to use this a lot when they're trying to uh, improve gradient descent, right? And believe it or not, this was proposed by some instructor in a Coursera class. So yeah, that's true. Uh, but but yeah, it is like, I would say like technically speaking, it's an improved version of this like eta delta, right? So we are directly using the expectation of this like G squared T, which is G squared is all the gradients up to step T. And this expected value is calculated using the weighted average, right? So you give some weightage to some previous uh, gradients and you give some weightage to your current gradient. That's all that is 
to this, this equation here. So this is known as RMS prop, and it's uh, already shown in like many of the research papers show that if you use a value of gamma equal to 0.9, it is shown to, to do really well. Now, how is it like helping us in the, the variable eta problem? Well, it's helping us because I can just like keep eta to a given already like this learning rate to some 0.001. But depending on the previous gradients, this entire, this entire thing is going to change. The second term is going to change. And so that's how it's helping us. So basically, we are saying my eta or my learning rate or my learning parameter is, um, is not a constant because now it's changing depending on like what were the gradient values from the previous steps. Okay, again, high level, if you think about it, it's like move faster. So this what this is saying is move faster when you're away from the minimum and move slow when you come closer to the minimum in like plain English. Yeah. Yeah. So these are some of the important optimization algorithms. The final one that I'm going to talk about is the Adams. And of course, you're going to come across this term a lot because this is the one that's, that, that is being used um, in the industry and in like most applications. Now, the only thing, and this is, Adam, this is known as Adams, which comes from adaptive moment estimation. And not if you were thinking that the inventor was like, or, or the person who came up with this was Adam. So that's not the case. <laughs> so this is, that's what I thought, like when I saw this for the first time. Uh, okay, so this is adaptive moment estimation. So that's where the term Adam comes from. Now it is using the same logic that we just talked about. Take some information from the previous gradients and use them now to determine your learning rate. It is using the same information, like the same idea. The only difference here is that this, like this algorithm is saying, why are we only using the sum squared uh, mean of the previous uh, uh, gradients? Why don't we also look at their variance? Well, because we can, right? So we are just like taking the sum of the squares of the means of like, if you look at it, I'm just taking the sum of the squares of all the gradients. That's kind of like the expected value of that. So think about it, it's like the mean of all those. Right? That's what the expectation is, like the mean of those values. So this algorithm says, in addition to that information, also look at the variance of all those. Why not take the variance? And so that's where this moment comes in, right? So it's, it's saying, uh, why not like take this exponentially decaying average of past square gradients, which is this, right? And also uh, exponentially decaying average of past gradients, like similar to the moment, like this one. So take the gradient itself, which is GT, and take the square of the gradients as well. So if you don't get the math right right now, that's fine. Just think about like getting information from the previous iterations. That's I think more than sufficient, getting information from previous iterations. That's all this is doing. But it's also looking at not just like the, the square terms, but also like it's also looking at the, the actual gradients as well, right? So how does that help? Well, when I'm going to do my update step, I'm going to, this is how the, the estimation is done. And then I'm going to use this estimate here, right? Okay, so if you're getting overwhelmed with the math, the, the good news is that there are packages that you can directly use to implement this, but it's important for you to understand what's going uh, behind the scenes, right? So if on the homework, I ask you to use one of these optimization uh, frameworks, uh, you will have to go and figure out how to implement, like for example, Adams or RMS prop using some package. That's that's the worst case scenario. But I really want uh, you to understand what's happening behind the scenes. So high level, it makes sense that you just like remember that we are not discarding any information that we have from the previous updates, but rather we are keeping it and that is helping us optimize this um, gradient descent, if that makes sense. Okay, I think I gave a lot of math and that like I can see everybody tired. So uh, I'm going to skip like this ADA max because it just builds on this uh, Adams. So again, like maybe reiterating like RMS prop and Adams are the two algorithms that I feel everybody should understand really well. So those, those are the two that you must go back and maybe reread this or maybe like look, look at more resources of like uh, understanding these. Uh, all right, so questions, anything? I already like made everybody so tired with the. <laughs> okay, I don't see any questions for from people who are online. 
So let's go back. There is another paper, which obviously we'll not be reading here, but I'll just like give you an uh, idea of what, so this actually, this paper actually talks about what happens if you have like sparse data and how to deal with that, right? So I'm not going into the details of this one, which is just like an extra reading. If you're interested in how to work with those like low rank matrix factorization things, you can just go here and, and just like give it a quick read. So this is just like in addition to what we already know. But the paper that we just covered, this is something that you must save and keep it uh, because this is like um, this is like really useful information. This is a good resource to, to keep. Uh, all right, so that's all I have actually for today's lecture. Uh, as I said earlier, homework one will be released sometime today and I'm going to like make a post about it, right? So you will get an email. And of course, if you have questions about the material that we covered in class today, or if you have questions about the homework, uh, you can put that, put that on the discussion forum. Do not share your code, do not share your response, but you can ask questions, of course, right? And yeah, my office hours are Thursday, one to two, so you can attend those. This homework is gonna be due next Friday night. So that's like, you have a week finish that. Okay, so any questions before we end? Anything related to the course? Yeah. Yes, yes. So I have like, uh, I'll have instructions on the homework document itself, like how to submit. Uh, because you will be submitting on submittee. The thing is that like the grading rubric and everything can be created on submittee. So I'll have to grade there. But all you'll be doing is providing a link to your like project and I'll just go there and I can just grade it. Yeah. Other questions, doubts? Okay then, thank you everyone for joining and see you I think Friday, right? Thank you people who are online.